messages where it's going to benefit you to be able to look at the Bible as we run the narrative of 1 Kings 22. So even if you don't have a copy that you brought with you, grab one of the pew Bibles, turn to 1 Kings 22, and uh, you'll be able to follow along. And it's really a, an excellent tool as well for helping you to read narrative sections and as you're reading them to stop and pause and think about certain aspects of the story. But we do have a couple verses that we're going to key in on. Uh, these aren't the only verses we'll key in on, but these are some highlights. We're going to put them up on the screen for you, and then we'll leave them there as well. Uh, you see verse 6, verse 7, 8, and then 13, 14 kind of is one lesson there. Verse 15, and then verse 28 and verse 34. Again, these aren't the only passages that we'll highlight, but these are some of the key passages. You know, we're in our fourth lesson now on profiles in biblical courage. It's a reminder that if, if Christians in today's day and age need anything, it's courage. You know, whether you're living here in the United States, which we have boasted is a free country, allows freedom of religious expression, that's now becoming very much something in question. Whether you're living here, you need courage, or if you're especially living overseas, say in the Middle East or in the Far East, you're going to be a Christian, you need courage. So these, this whole series is incredibly relevant to where we are. We started our series with a look at Daniel the prophet, and we considered how courageous he was that just as he was reaching the highlight, the pinnacle of his career, he was called upon once again to make a decision. Will he serve God or will he serve human authorities? And he made the right decision. Can you imagine if Daniel had made the decision to just stop praying? Or imagine if his friends had made the decision, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to actually worship the image of the king when the king commanded that everyone bow down and worship the image before them. Would we even have their stories in scripture? No. The stories are there because they're incredible examples of commitment to God above all else, which is what God is asking us for. Uh, we considered as well the Apostle Paul and the fact that his life is in every regard a profile in courage. We talked about the fact that he's a man of action, a man of his word and of hard work. He, he said what he meant, he lived what he said, and then he worked hard toward that end. We said he was a man of uncompromising commitment to Jesus Christ and unrelenting when it came to sharing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we said we have to be the same way. That's what we must do in this day and age. We must be a people of action, not so passive that everything happens around us and then we're the very last ones to kind of pop up our heads and go, what? What happened? What's going on? But no, people of action, particularly when it comes to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be very forward thinking and we should be the first ones to step out, not in a, in a belligerent, mean-spirited, antagonistic way, but in a bold yet compassionate way, we should be the very first ones to act. And when we act, we should know that what we say matters, and it especially has to be measured by the way that we live. We should be people of our word, and if there's anything that we're going to give ourselves to, should it not be the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Look at how many things we give ourselves to in our society. Noble things like you know, your job, your occupation, but then other things. You wouldn't necessarily say they're noble, but they're, they're certainly things that people give their all for, and our society goes right and follows suit by putting so much attention and focus on it. The things of entertainment, sports, movies, music, I mean, sure, these things can be good and well in and of themselves, but look at how much people pour into them. Should we not be willing to pour even more into the furtherance of the gospel? Absolutely uncompromising in our commitment to Christ, unrelenting in our proclamation of the gospel. That's what God has called us to. Our third lesson uh, last week was from two women. Deborah and from Esther. Deborah, the judge from the book of Judges, and the courage that she had to call the male leader, the patriarch of Israel at the time, Barak, and she said, look, you're supposed to be going to war. You're supposed to fight against the enemies of the people of God, and God is commanding you. Go and do this. But Barak was afraid, and he said, okay, if you, the prophetess, are telling me this is what God says, then put your actions where your words are. 
I will go to war if you go with me. But if you don't go to war with me, Deborah, then I won't go to war. And what did Deborah say? I will surely do this. I mean, this is exactly what I want you to do. I will join you in it because God's calling us to this. And yet she said to him, but because of your hesitation, because of your fear bar, you will not receive the glory in this victory. It will go to another. It will go to a woman. And then we looked at Esther, the queen of a pagan king, one of many queens and concubines, but she comes to a place of favor in the eyes of the king. And the, the decree had gone out in the kingdom that the Jews should be annihilated on a particular day. And it was Esther's relative Mordecai who said, Esther, you have to do something here. You can't sit by silently. But know this, if you do sit by silently, somehow, some way, God will fulfill his promise to his people. And there will be deliverance. But as for you and me, we will be destroyed. And don't think just because you're the, the king's favorite that they're going to spare you. You will be destroyed as well. But then he won her over with these words. Mordecai said to her, who knows whether or not you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Christian, do you see your life like that? I mean, the, the, the purpose that was in Esther's life that is captured in that one passage for such a time as this. God wants you to have an understanding of purpose in your life with that kind of clarity. Not on the specifics. You know, Lord, what should I do uh, occupationally? Should I take this job or should I take that job? Lord, you know, which, which house should I live in? Where should, th those things can, they're big decisions, but in the essence of life, they're peripheral decisions. The big decision is, are you going to be a committed follower of God? Are you going to be a follower of Jesus Christ in this life? You say yes to that, and then God gives you that clarity and that purpose. You were placed here for such a time as this, as challenging as it is to be a Christian in this day and age. God put you here for this purpose, for this time. And as we talked about the purpose in Esther's life and the courage in Deborah's life, and then we fused them together, and we said, you know, what good is courage without purpose? And that would be all this pent-up energy with really no direction, no focus to it. But likewise, what good is purpose if you don't have the courage? You can have great clarity and focus as to what God's called you to do, but if you don't have the courage to do it, you might as well not even have the purpose and the focus in the first place. No, courage and purpose go together. We need them both in our lives in order to bear witness to all that God is calling us to in this world. And so today we come to our final character, a very much lesser known character in scripture, the prophet Micaiah. Micaiah's life is an interesting one. There are other people named Micaiah, but this prophet in particular, he comes on the scene here and here only. It's like a, a blip on the radar screen, but believe you me, everyone in the control room sees this blip. It's not like somebody on another, another uh, screen says, did, did you see that? No, everybody sees it. It's so incredible what this man does that even though it's just for a moment that we see him, we remember him the rest of our lives after you read this last chapter of the first book of Kings. From Micaiah's life, we learn that we should speak the truth regardless of opposition. Speak the truth always. We learn, secondly, that we should respect God before we respect men. Not that we're disrespectful to men, but by no means are we to respect them and honor them more than we should honor God. And then third, we learn that we should honor and trust God with the outcome of our lives. That it's not always going to go the way we expect it to go, but in the end, we can trust God, no matter what. And we'll revisit those things briefly when we finish up 1 Kings 22. We're just going to read to verse 34 as we run the narrative. But let's start right there at the beginning again. 1 Kings 22.1, three years has passed without war between Syria and Israel. Uh, one of the things we learn from history is that we don't what? You know the saying. One of the things we learn from history is that we don't learn anything from history, right? Because we don't pay attention to it enough, especially in this day and age where everything's about math and science, math and science, math and science. Well, social studies is incredibly important because you look at what's happened in the past and it repeats itself. Is there tension between Syria and Israel today? Are they dis in disputes over land today? Yeah, no doubt about it and you learn from the past what's going on in the present, and you can also make predictions as to the future. There was tension all the way back then in the time of the kings with Syria and with Israel. In the third year of this peace, Jehoshaphat, 
who is the leader of Judah, the southern kingdom, and what we, what we know of as Israel today was at this time broken into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom is called Judah. The northern kingdom is called Israel. The king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, goes down to, see, to Samaria to speak with the king of Israel, Ahab. Now, why does he go down? When we refer to up and down with respect to directions, we're referring to cardinal directions. You go up north, right? You go down south. But they're not thinking cardinal directions. They're thinking topography. Why? Uh, they, didn't, they, didn't necess- they didn't drive. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have trains. I mean, certainly they had horses and they had uh, chariots, but most people didn't travel that way. So if you were going to Jerusalem, way up in the mountains of Judea, you knew no mistake at all about it. You were going which direction? Up. If you're leaving Jerusalem, you're going down. So he's leaving the mountains and he's going down to Samaria to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel wants to go to war against Syria. Verse 3, the king of Israel says to his servants, Do you not know that Ramot and Gilead is ours? Was our territory? They took it. We should take it back. And since the the king of of Judah, Jehoshaphat, is here with him, he says to him in verse 4, Will you join me in this? I mean, even though we are two kingdoms, we are one people, will you join forces with me so we can take back this area from the king of Syria? And Jehoshaphat says to him at the end of verse 4, I am as you are. My soldiers will be your soldiers. My horses, your horses. But look at verse 5. Let's let's ask the Lord about whether or not we should do this. Will you please inquire for the word of the Lord today? Whenever you set out to do something of significance, you should always learn this lesson from Jehoshaphat. Inquire of the word of the Lord. And you may not get a clear answer. I mean, you may be praying about important issues of where you should live, where you should work, uh, who you should marry, etc. And you may not have this definitive clarity. Be patient. As the scriptures say elsewhere, let patience have its perfect work. But we make very big mistakes when we launch out and make significant decisions without ever inquiring at the word of the Lord. And how do you inquire at the word of the Lord? Well, you spend time in prayer. You spend time with God's people. You know, bounce, bounce the idea. Bounce what you're thinking off of a few individuals that you respect, that you know are going to give you godly advice. And, of course, we understand the word of the Lord from the word of the Lord. Spend time in Scripture. Jehoshaphat has it right. He wants to hear a word from God before they venture out on this. But look at verse 6. The king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 of them, and he said to them, Shall I go against remote Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? And they said to the king, Sure, go up. There's no doubt. God wants you to do this. God will deliver the Syrians into your hands and you will take remote Gilead once again. I mean, they are enthusiastic about this. But when you look at verse 3, or I'm sorry, verse 6, it reminds you of this. Beware of group thought. Be, Be very careful when it comes to the herd mentality that you see quite a bit in culture. I mean, this isn't something that's relegated to your teenage years where you just following peer pressure in the crowd. It is incredibly pervasive in society, all societies. Whether you're talking about the situation here in Samaria, in the northern kingdom of Israel, under the reign of Ahab, as he wants to go out and do this, and everyone knows that he wants to take remote Gilead, so rather than speak the truth, everybody just gets on board with what the king wants to hear. And pretty soon, it's not just what the king wants to hear, it's what everybody wants to hear. So you have 400 individuals who are supposed to be leaders in their own right. They're not leading at all. They're just getting on the bandwagon with group thought. Let me tell you, one of the places group thought is most prevalent is in the academy. You know, I thank the Lord for the opportunities that I've been able to have in life, in very living and, and, and functioning in very diverse settings, from the military you know, to Ivy League institutions, And I'll tell you, group thought is more prevalent in academic institutions than anywhere else I've seen. On any given day of any given week, you'll find more diversity of thought amongst the soldiers of the 82nd Airborne Division than you would of the students that are at Harvard or Duke or Princeton or Yale or Gardner-Webb or any... There seems to be a collective group thought when people go to the academy. And that is what's driving a lot of the social direction that we're going in our day and age today. It's not clear-headed thinking. It's not even intellectual. 
Some of you have heard me say this before. Intellectuals don't think the way they think because it's the smart way to think. They think the way they think because they think that's how smart people should think. And that's very, very different. It's exactly what's going on here in 1 Kings 22. Beware of group thought. When Jesus Christ sets you free, He sets you free indeed. And the first place He sets you free is right here in the mind. Where He frees you from your own sinfulness. You know you're a sinner and you know there's a penalty for sin, but you realize, no, Christ is greater than that. That's why He went to the cross. He frees you first from your own guilt and sinfulness. He frees you from that bondage of sin, not that you're a perfect creature, but now you're struggling to sin, not struggling to seek God, but you're, you're struggling because you don't want to sin. You want to honor God. He's changed your life. But then he also frees you, not only from sin, not only from the guilty conscience, he frees you from group thought, where you have the strength to be able to say, no, that, this does not make sense. This, and not only does it not make sense, sometimes it's just flat out, this is not right. What you people are saying, and I don't care if it's 400 of you, I don't care if it's 1,000 of you, what all of you are saying is wrong. And you're willing to stand because you're free in Christ. Well, as we continue, even though there's 400 prophets of the king of Israel, 